Hi, everybody. So now we're finally going to put some of this probability theory to use, and it'll give us a way to interpret some of the work that we've already done, and we'll have more opportunities to, uh, to use it later. And so now what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about statistical models and um, uh, a process known as maximum likelihood estimation. So uh, let me begin by some sort of general remarks. And before talking about statistical models, let's think for a minute about mathematical models, generally. A statistical model is a kind of a mathematical model. Um, so you have probably come across many mathematical models that govern physical systems. For example, maybe you have a vibrating object. You might try to model the vibrating object by thinking of the system of a block connected to a spring. And considering the motion of this block, uh, under the influence of, of the spring. And the motion is governed by sort of general laws, namely Newton's laws. But it's also um, has some parameters in it. And the parameters might be, for example, the mass of the block, and um, maybe most importantly, the stiffness, the spring constant, which controls how, uh, how springy the spring is. And one of the things you need to do if you have such a mathematical model is you need to fit the model to the physical situation. And to do that, you kind of work backwards. You look at how the parameters affect the behavior of the model. Then you look at the, you actually observe the system that you're interested in. And then you work backwards to try to fit the parameters to most closely model the uh, things that you're observing. I mean, we've seen a lot of this in the whole COVID business where people have tried to make predictions about the number of cases and they construct some kind of an epidemiological model which has a lot of parameters in it. And then they look at the behavior of the epidemic and try to set the values of the parameters to, um, to match what they see. And then with those parameters, that enables them to go forward and, uh, and make predictions into the future. A statistical model is a mathematical model where the behavior is uh, statistical. It's governed by probability instead of just by, for example, something like a differential equation. So it's a mathematical model that has randomness in it. And you try to quantify that randomness uh, in a way that ena ena enables you to make some kind of prediction. So uh, I'm going to now look at three examples of statistical models and also talk a little bit about this process of fitting a statistical model to a particular situation, which amounts, so typically your model will have some unknown parameters in it, and then you use observations and data to try to figure out what the correct values of those parameters should be. And there's many methods to do that. The simplest one is called maximum likelihood, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. So let's start with a very simple example. Uh, suppose you have a coin, and you would like to know what is the probability that this coin gives heads when you flip it. So your mathematical, your statistical model here is that each flip of your coin <coughs> is an independent Bernoulli random variable with an unknown parameter p, which is the probability of getting heads. And the question is, what is p? Um, so let's say now you do an experiment, and you flip the coin 100 times, and you get 55 heads and 45 tails. Now, the idea behind maximum likelihood is to ask, what is the chance that I could have gotten this result as a function of the parameters of the model? So if I treat the probability of heads as an unknown variable, the chance that I would have gotten 55 heads and 45 tails from, 55, from 100 flips of my coin is given by the binomial distribution. And this would be the formula. The, um, there are, remember that each uh, choice of sequence of 55 heads and 45 tails has probability p to the 55, 1 minus p to the 45. But there are 100 choose 55 possible such sequences. And what we're going to use for our estimate of the parameter is we're going to say what choice of p makes our result most likely. 
what choice, that's why it's called maximum likelihood, makes our result most likely. And this is an optimization problem. Namely, we are going to maximize the function L using the parameter P as a variable. And that's something we've been doing a lot of in this course, and it's a simple calculus problem. If you take the derivative of L with respect to P and set it equal to zero, you get um, this uh, polynomial. And if you notice, you can cancel one minus P to the 44 out of this. So you're left with one minus P and you can cancel p to the 54 out of this, so you're left with p, and you end up with this equation. And um, if you solve this equation, it says that p is to 1 minus p as 55 is to 45, and it's a little algebra problem to show that that tells you that the most likely value for p, given your results, is 55 out of 100. Now, Maybe that doesn't surprise you. That seems like a very natural uh, estimate, but now you have a, somehow a rationale for it. If you get 55 heads out of 100, then the most likely value of P is 55 over 100. Now, it's a much more subtle question as to whether or not you might ask, is this a fair coin? Because just because 55 out of 100 is the most likely value of P, um, other values of P are also likely, and this particular experiment might have produced a, um, a different result if you did it again. So th that leads you into the whole area of hypothesis testing and so forth in statistics. We're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to stick to this idea of maximum likelihood. But you should be aware that, that a maximum likelihood estimate is a far cry from saying that this is not a fair coin, that the chance is really 0.55 because um, unlikely things happen all the time. And so the true value might not be the most likely one. Okay, now we're gonna look at two more examples from continuous probability distributions. So one situation that we've looked at a lot is the problem of independent normally distributed errors. So we've looked at this, for example, in the context of temperature and we've assumed that we uh, have measured, we have our thermometer, we go outside, we measure the temperature, we get a reading, but because of errors, we get, uh, we're off by a, ran a normally distributed error from the true temperature. And uh, the probability distribution for these errors is normal, so the probability density function is given by the normal distribution that we've seen a lot of. But there is a parameter in this uh, distribution, which is the variance. And if we're going to model, if we want to model our thermometer, so we kind of want to know what are we likely to get if we continue using it, we'd like to have an estimate in the variance because in the future that'll tell us how much our measurements of the temperature are likely to be off from the, two, from the true value. And so we've gone out and we've made n independent, n independent measurements of the temperature, and we've done this in a controlled way where we know the true temperature. And because we know the true temperature, we know the actual errors that we've measured. And we know that they're given by x1 up to xn, and they're independent. And as we've seen before, the, the probability of these independent uh, measurements is given by the product, the density anyway, is given by the product of the densities. And so the likelihood function in the continuous case is the density function evaluated at the data that we've obtained. And, uh, in this case, it turns out to be 1 over sigma squared to 2 pi to the n e to the minus norm of x squared over 2 sigma squared. This is the product of a bunch of these density functions evaluated at each of the different xi's. And what we'd like to know is what value of sigma makes this result most likely. And this is a case where you can just take the derivative and set it equal to zero, but you will make your life a lot easier if instead you take the logarithm. And instead of maximizing the function, you maximize the logarithm of the function, which is the same thing. The log of this is minus n log sigma. This comes from the fact that sigma is in the denominator here. So the derivative of one over sigma to the n is minus n log sigma. And then you 
take you add and you get the logarithm of e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared. That's just minus norm x squared over 2 sigma squared. And there's a log of the square root of 2 pi or something. And we just throw that into the constant because we're going to take the derivative of this and it doesn't matter. And if we take the derivative of p with respect to sigma, we get minus n over sigma minus the norm of x squared over 2 sigma squared. Sorry, <laughs> got to take the derivative. Let's try again. Uh, this is going to be um, plus the norm of x squared over sigma cubed because the derivative of 2 sigma to the minus 2 is 2, sorry, of 1 half sigma to the minus 2 is minus sigma to the minus 3. And we set this equal to 0. And uh, from this, you get the formula that sigma squared is equal to the norm of x squared over n. And this should leap out at you, because what is this telling you? Well, the norm of x squared over n is the sum of the squares of the errors. from i equals 1 to n. And so what we've got here is the, me the mean squared error. It's the average of the squared errors. So the maximum likelihood, here I've written it down here, the maximum likelihood estimate of the variance in this situation is the mean squared error. And this is one justification for using the mean squared error as a, as a stand-in, if you like, for the variance or as a guide to the variance because um, our best, uh, the most likely value of the variance, if you make independent measurements from a normal distribution, is the mean squared error of those, um, of those results. Now we're going to do one more example, uh, which has to deal with our earlier calculations involving linear regression. And I'm going to stick to the case of two variables, but the same argument works in the n-dimensional case as well. It just has fewer indices to work for. So what's our statistical model? Our statistical model is that we have a value y that we're trying to predict linearly from an input value x. And y is given by mx plus b, but it's thrown off by an error, which is normally distributed with variance sigma squared. So the xi yi that we're trying to fit to our line came from some true values of m and b. So yi, the, the true value of y is mxi plus b, but yi is thrown off from that by this randomly chosen error. So this is an example of a statistical model. It's called a linear model. And having set up this model and made some observations, the question we can ask is, how should we choose m b, and the sigma for our error so that our observed data is most likely. And the way to approach that is to sort of turn this around and realize that the error is y minus mx minus b, and we've measured this, the xi, yi. So we've actually measured errors, ep, x, I, I guess I'll call it epsilon i, is yi minus mxi minus b. And these are independent measurements of error from a normal distribution. And that's exactly the situation we considered in the previous example. And the density function is a function of m, b, and sigma, but it's our usual friend, the normal distribution, where the error is uh, the sum of the errors squared over 2 sigma squared. And the, um, the log likelihood, once again, it's easier to take the derivative of the log and set it equal to zero than it is to take the um, original function, is similar to what we did last time. This right here is playing the role of the norm of x squared. It's the sum, there's a constant here that I omitted. It's the sum of the squares of the errors. So now we want to find the most likely choices of m, b, and sigma to account for our observations. So we want to maximize this. And so we take it 
partial derivatives. So the first thing to notice is if you take the partial derivative of the log p with respect to m, that's this is sigma, it has no m in it. 1 over sigma squared is just a constant. And so you end up taking the derivative with respect to m of something that should look quite familiar. It's the sum of yi minus mxi minus b squared and the der derivative up, up to constants and so forth. And similarly, when you take the derivative of log p with respect to b, you're taking d by db of this. And when you set about solving that, the sigma becomes irrelevant, and you get the least squared solution. So m and b are given by the solution that we did before, the ordinary least squares solution, because we're taking the derivative of this sum of the squares of the errors. What about sigma? Well, if we take the derivative with respect to sigma, we actually did this in the previous example. If we take the derivative of log p with respect to sigma, we get minus n over sigma minus the sum of yi minus mxi minus b squared over sigma cubed, but it becomes plus, I believe. And so sigma squared, we set that equal to zero, and we get sigma squared is one over n sum yi minus mxi minus b squared, which is what we called the mean squared error for m and b. So now we have an interpretation of ordinary least squares, namely, the m and b that you get for ordinary least squares is finds the line which is most likely assuming that the errors that you're seeing are independent and normally distributed, and the best estimate of the variance of those errors is the mean squared error. Maybe I'll conclude by saying that one consequence of this is that in the underlying mathematics of ordinary least squares, the variance doesn't depend on x. These error terms, the variance in the error, is the same no matter what x is. And what that means is that if you were to look sort of at the, um, at the data, for each x value, the spread of the data should be about the same. Otherwise, it's not consistent with the assumption that the errors are all have the same distribution. If they don't, so this is a one a word you might sometimes hear. If the errors don't have this property, in other words, the variance changes a lot. That's called heteroscedasticity. Heteroscedasticity. And it means that the assumptions that, that your, your underlying model, which is that the errors have the same variance regardless of x, doesn't hold. And therefore, you can't interpret ordinary least squares as a maximum likelihood solution. And um, this is actually a common problem in the application of least squares in a lot of situations. And if you look at the uh, automobile data, there's a good case for saying that um, in the plot that we made of engine displacement versus miles per gallon, the variance seems to change a lot uh, depending on what the x-axis is. So uh, one can criticize the application of least squares in that situation.